Hi, I'm Marilee Beck, a longtime member of the Friends of Robinson Gardens, and we are so grateful for your support of our 2014 Patron Gala. Take this virtual tour of the Virginia Robinson Gardens and see what it's like in the daylight. It's one of my favorite places in the world. We hope you'll come back and see us in person very soon. My name is Tim Lindsay, and I'm the superintendent of the Virginia Robinson Gardens and have been for the last 17 years. It's been a joy and a pleasure to oversee both the conservation and the restoration of this historic property, the first estate of Beverly Hills. The Robinsons came here as children uh, at the turn of last century with their families. I think they were four and five years old. Uh, they played together as children and later in life married. Harry's father was the owner of the J.W. Robinson department store, and Virginia's father was a builder, a developer, architect. The story goes they were on their way to the newly opened Los Angeles Country Club on Wilshire Boulevard. They literally got lost, and, and, and getting lost, they ended up on top of this knoll. We're about 450 feet above sea level with tremendous views to both the Pacific Ocean and Catalina Island, as well as uh, San Gabriel Mountains, the San Bernardino Mountains, and on a very exceptionally clear day, all the way to Palm Springs. So that's 1911 and predates the city of Beverly Hills by three years. There wasn't a single tree on the property when they purchased this property. It was barren, had been grazed by first cattle, secondly sheep. And so anything that was left was either uh, turned over and they planted a winter crop that would grow during a rainy season on the flats. Uh, we have a, a photograph, a view from the front porch in 1911. And as far as you can see, looking south, uh, east, it's all barley fields and there's not a single structure in the picture. This is the main entrance to the house. And this is where you can get a good feel for the style of the architecture, which is the Beaux Arts style. It has the uh, double Tuscan columns and the parapet at the top with the urns. Those are all characteristic, you know, architectural elements. Well, there'd be a staff member at the pedestrian gate, so you would pull up and the valet would take your car and the gate man would direct you up to the house. And then as soon as you got to the front door and your foot landed on that first step, the, the uh, staff assigned to the door would be looking through the peak hole and he would open the door so you wouldn't have to do that yourself. And then Virginia would be in a receiving line and you'd be received in the entry hall. Typically, the social part of the house is going to be the entry hall, the great lawn, um, the dining room and the yellow salon. They also would sometimes have such a large party, I think once they got above 300 uh, people seated on the Great Lawn, they would run, run out of room for a dance floor, so Virginia would have the, the carpet rolled up in here and they would use the entry hall for dancing. <laughs> Well, the library has a magnificent carpet. These antique Persian rugs were one of Virginia's favorites, and she collected one for each room of the house. They're mostly uh, vibrant in candlelight, and so the whole house was often lit by candles, and so many textiles with the gold threads and silver threads are um, intentionally designed so that they show uh, and sparkle in candlelight. This room was special to Virginia because she would meet here in the morning. That's how its name came about, the morning room. She would typically be sitting here and her major domo would stand there and they would go over the week's menus and uh, for her parties. And the most significant social event about this room was one afternoon um, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor had um, come over from England on the Queen Mary and they um, drove their Austin Martin up from Long Beach to have afternoon tea with Virginia in this room. There's uh, also a lot of history here, not only of the family, 
uh, but it's actually encapsulating the history of various cultures. They have a lot of Louis XIV and Louis XV furnishings. Actually, some of the furnishings in the house are completely illegal. We have Boule tables, which are made up of tortoise shell and uh, ivory. And of course, those, those two types of materials are no longer uh, legally used. Uh, but now this is a very good way to preserve those, those artifacts so that people can understand that they were used uh, to create objects of beauty. So this is exactly how she left it. I mentioned it's an as-found type of museum. But she lived her life here um, for 66 years. Uh, and she lived here with Harry until 1932 when he passed away. And then she carried on after that and lived very much in the same style uh, as before. Um, typically there was a Wednesday night sit down black tie dinner. Um, Saturdays was started with tennis and then swimming in the, in the pool and then um, having a, a, an afternoon barbecue. And Sunday nights was a black tie uh, fair. The staff was trained in the same protocol uh, as the staff of the White House. So after uh, 6 p.m., the male staff changed uniform and had uh, long tails and wore black ties. She's a very gracious hostess and they had terrific meals and I think she would have been easily nominated hands down the queen of parties and organizing very lovely parties and people just would uh, be so happy to be on her guest list. She was actually known as the First Lady of Beverly Hills, and um, there was sort of this ongoing thing between her and Mary Pickford, because Mary Pickford also moved here very early on, and commonly when she was here for dinner at, one, at some course during the evening, probably sitting at the dinner table, because they would sit at opposite ends of the table, she would say something, my dear friend Mary, the First Lady of Beverly Hills, has something she'd like to say, and then Mary would rhetorically say, no, it's Virginia who's the First Lady of Beverly Hills. So that was just an ongoing saga through the years. Well, she was planning her 100th birthday party when she passed away. She actually passed away two months short of reaching the 100-year uh, mark. People always asked her the question, how is it that everybody that comes here has such a wonderful time? And she said, that's because I do. And she said, if the hostess has a wonderful time, the guests will too. Here we're looking at the pool pavilion, which was uh, built in 1925 when Harry was president of the Robinson department store. This is an Italian revival building. It's modeled after an actual villa in Straw, Italy, where they had sent an architect to study this building uh, that's called Villa Pisani. Uh, they had been there and they really liked it, so they wanted to recreate something sort of a facsimile of what's existing over there in Straw, Italy. Uh, these are Palladian doors, which are uh, incredible to look at, but also mechanically when you open them there's actually three different positions. So here's an example of living in a Mediterranean climate like that in Italy where this is from, where you can have the indoor and outdoor environment seamless. And, and oftentimes it was set up like a living room with two sofas, chairs, and there's a beautiful fireplace in the middle here. The clock that we're looking at here is the oldest piece of furniture on the property. It was imported from Italy, and it actually matches all the other Italian furniture that's located in the entry of the main house. And the reason there's the separation is Virginia felt because it was the oldest of the ensemble of furniture, it deserved to be in the most prominent building, which is the pool pavilion. So the house is actually, it's 6,000 square feet, which it's not a large house, certainly by today's standards, but they appreciated the outdoors um, the most, and they lived outdoors, and that's why all these terraces are furnished, and you can sit, and they would oftentimes play bridge outside. They love plants, and when they traveled, uh, typically they'd bring with them a plantsman. His name was Mr. Rhodes, and this gentleman had the uh, the job of sourcing rare and unusual plants when they traveled the world and then having those shipped back here uh, so they could grow them and experiment on their estate. The, the biggest compliment we ever get is when people visit the gardens and say to us, it feels like the Robinsons could come home at any time. People come here and they'll look at the great lawn and they'll say, uh, well, how do you get a lawn to look like this? Uh, and we'll say, well, you have to wait about 100 years. 
<laughs> because a lot of things just take time. And when you're talking about gardening, um, gardening has, you know, three dimensions like most objects, but the fourth dimension in gardens is time. This is the oldest tree on the property. That's a blue gum eucalyptus. It's the granddaddy of a hundred blue gum eucalyptus that were planted on the property. And the reason we know that is we have a receipt for the purchase of 100 blue gum eucalyptus in 1911 for a buck a piece because they had no trees on the property and they needed a windbreak, they needed shade, and they needed something to give the property a little more definition. So they planted 100 of those and this is the last one, last existing one. The others have been slowly edited out or have fallen over uh, because the garden now that was planted after they were planted has matured. This cactus here is called a pipe organ cactus. And the pipe organ cactus came from the Huntington Estate. It's an interesting plant because it's a night blooming cactus that's pollinated by moths or bats. The uh, coral tree, which you can see behind me just over here, um, that's a South African tree. She traveled to South Africa and procured that and other plants. And as it grew, it became a spectacle. People would stop and say, wow, you know, I haven't seen that tree before with these orange blossoms, the color of coral. And uh, so the city of Los Angeles uh, caught wind of this tree and, and its beauty and asked Virginia if she might be able to provide them with some cuttings. And she said, I'll allow you to come and take cuttings from my tree. What do you want to do with them? And they said, well, we don't have any trees running down West San Vicente, and that's where we're going to plant them. And so they're still there today. Uh, and you can drive down there, and there's you know, literally hundreds of them that are from our parent tree. She started thinking about this property and has sh how she and her husband had spent 66 years developing it from essentially a barren site into a lush garden with rare plants. And she thought, what a great way to share my passion and, and also present the garden in a, a way that it could become an educational tool for the betterment of horticulture. So in her last will and testament, she wanted this property to be a public entity operated for the betterment of the public, for the enjoyment of the public, for the betterment of, of horticulture in California, a regional center for studying plants. We have third grade school classes come through the gardens in addition to adult tours. And we focus on this tree and talk about the tropical forest. These roots do two things for a tree that is existing in a tropical forest. They allow the canopy of the, to get to the light, to get thrusted up above the other competing vegetation. And secondarily, they're adding support for this canopy. These big, tall, 60-foot trees are called king palms. So the seeds that you see up there, the red balls, are actually falling to the ground and then germinating and coming up as seedlings, which then grow into f trees. This is the only place in uh, North America where they reproduce naturally without the seeds being collected and put in a greenhouse and a controlled environment. There's 150 species of birds that have been documented on the property. It's a haven. She was very caring about animals. They had dogs and cats and desert tortoise and owls and many, many songbirds that were in an aviary. So people that came here were, um, and that I've collected oral history from, were just enamored with sort of this exotic zoo that she had. So they had three different monkeys that lived on the property. Um, originally, the monkeys were allowed just to be free on the property and, and go where they pleased and knock on the windows in the morning to get the Robinsons out of bed. But she actually was one to be out in the garden. She, we have uh, uh, home movies of her doing some cutting in the palm forest here with gardening boots on. She was out. Uh, in the garden twice a day after she turned 85 with her major domo and then he would communicate all her uh, directives to the gardening staff at 12. Reagans were here. In fact, uh, after uh, Ronald Reagan became president of the United States, he wrote a letter to the county and to the friends saying that the relationship, the private-public relationship they shared between a, a, a governmental entity and a nonprofit was exemplary and should be carried out through the, the rest of the nation. 
We want to share this with people, and the way we do that is uh, you can book a tour here Tuesday through Friday at either 10 a.m. or 1. It can be one person or 50 people. Uh, we can take up to 100 people a day. And when you arrive here, you get a docent-led tour with somebody that's very knowledgeable about the history of the property, the plants that you're looking at, the artifacts you're looking at in the house. So you leave here with a sensibility of what it was like to live in an early 20th century estate in Southern California.